Hi there. I'm Trudy Bearden with Comatch and Health. We have partnered with the College of Nursing at the University of Utah to bring this webinar to you, Telemedicine and Virtual Services to Enhance Access and Improve Care. Today we'd like to clarify the difference between telehealth, which is a discrete set of services and codes and other virtual services that together provide a suite of tools in the toolbox for remote service delivery to enhance access, keep patients safe, and also capture reimbursement for the organizations that are delivering those services. So we'll take a look at the full range of remote services for healthcare delivery and hopefully make the case for telehealth and virtual services to sustainably achieve the quadruple aim, which is decreasing per beneficiary cost, improving patient outcomes, and improving the experience of both the patient. And the fourth aim, of course, is improving the work life of staff around delivering healthcare services. And then we should always think about embedding improvement science in our work, including our telehealth journey. Technically, telehealth is an umbrella term for a lot that is um, above and beyond what we consider billable services for delivering healthcare services. Practically, as I mentioned earlier, telehealth is a discrete set of services that are defined by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, or CMS. Together, if we were to take that telehealth, the practical definition, that set of telehealth codes and services and add it to virtual services, it fits the bill for telemedicine. Although there is some debate about which virtual services are and are not considered telemedicine, um, so there are those uh, other virtual services that we'll talk about as well. And we will also talk about the difference between synchronous and asynchronous. So synchronous is we're together at the same time. So having a phone conversation or being on a Zoom meeting together, that synchronous asynchronous is like email. So I send you an email and then you respond to me. So it's asynchronous. And just to be clear, as we go through this information, we really are focusing on the role of the RN, the role of the nurse in remote healthcare service delivery. The technical definition of telehealth, um, there are a lot of definitions out there. The one that I see cited the most often is the one from Health Resources and Services Administration or HRSA. It's a very accurate and complete definition if you want to use it for future reference. As I mentioned, telehealth is, this is the big umbrella term. So the technical definition, telemedicine fits under telehealth and then under telemedicine fits telehealth and that discrete set of services and virtual services. It can get a little confusing for folks. Um, so hopefully we'll make that a little more clear by the end of this webinar. So before the public health emergency, telehealth services, specifically those discrete set of service codes, had to use an audio portion and a video portion to deliver those telehealth services. So the clinician and the patient could hear each other and they could see each other in real time. The distance site, sometimes called the hub, is where the clinician is. And the originating site, sometimes called the spoke, is where the patient is at the time the telehealth service is being provided. The clinician at their distant site is going to charge the health plan or Medicare. They're going to enter a code so that they can get reimbursed for delivering those services. There are certain situations where an organization can be reimbursed for the originating site. So for example, in a nursing facility, if a nursing facility provides the support for the patient to engage in a telehealth visit, they can bill an originating site fee, which for 2021 is $27.02. However, not all state Medicaid agencies reimburse for that originating site fee. Medicare does. So if the patient is Medicare, you can get 
you can capture that originating site fee. However, for example, in the state of Utah, Utah Medicaid currently does not reimburse for that originating site fee. Also, the originating site fee cannot be paid if the patient is at home. So this table demonstrates some of the allowances that were lifted or loosened or relaxed during the public health emergency. So prior to the public health emergency, there were about 100 telehealth codes. So that discrete set of services, there were about 100 codes, and that has been expanded to 250 codes or thereabouts. And it's updated every few months or so, uh, less updates recently compared to in 2020, but there is a list of telehealth services. It's a downloadable Excel spreadsheet, so one can see what are all of those codes and services that are defined in that discrete set of services. If you want to know what the reimbursement is for each of those codes, you have to go to the CMS lookup tool. Prior to the public health emergency, for all of those 100 telehealth codes, audio and visual video were required. And during the public health emergency, Medicare has allowed for several of those codes, about 90 of the 250 codes, to be performed using audio only. So no need for the video portion, which is a significant barrier um, for a lot of patients. They don't have the capability of doing the video portion for, an, uh, for a telehealth visit. Interestingly, the originating site where the patient is um, had to be rural, which had a very specific definition, and it had to be in a health professional shortage area. We are, there's legislation in place that will do away with those two requirements. I look forward to that. It doesn't make sense. We have urban areas that have, that are health, have health professional shortage areas and um, so during the public health emergency that has been waived and telehealth can be provided regardless of where the patient is, including if the patient is at their home. The distance site uh, could not, prior to the public health emergency, could not be a federally qualified health center or a rural health clinic, which really made not a lot of sense because this is where we need to expand access. During the public health emergency, that distance site has been expanded for FQHCs and RHCs, thankfully, and we've seen telehealth take off like crazy in the FQHCs and RHCs. Medicare also did not have a reimbursement model for the FQHCs and RHCs, um, and now the RHCs or FQHCs can bill any telehealth code or provide any service, um, and they receive a, a standard reimbursement regardless of the code. Also, now, during the public health emergency, we can provide telehealth to both new and established patients. Prior to the public health emergency, it was to established patients only. And once the public health emergency ends, we will go back to only being able to deliver telehealth to established patients only. And we will also go back to needing to use a HIPAA compliant device um, once the public health emergency ends. There is a whole set of eligible providers who can provide telehealth services and bill for those telehealth services. But as I mentioned, this material is geared towards the role of the nurse. And just like with in-person visits, nurses and the care team have important roles. And just to be clear, Medicare reimburses telehealth visits the same as in-person visits. The codes are the same, the reimbursement is the same, and the service description for each of those telehealth codes is the same, regardless of whether it's in-person or provided by telehealth. So a little bit of information here. There are blanket waivers that are related to telehealth. And a lot of people say, well, why can't CMS just make those waivers permanent? So those are waivers to the Social Security Act that literally need legislation or an act of Congress to make permanent. I will say that there is a lot of legislation in the pipeline now to make these waivers permanent, and I hope that that happens and we can fully implement and adopt telehealth without worrying about, is it before the public health emergency or after the public health emergency? 
So it's the waivers have made it easier for telemedicine services to be furnished to uh, a hospital or a critical access hospitals patients through an agreement with an offsite hospital, which is really important during uh, COVID-19. Visits for nursing home residents can be conducted by telehealth, which is great for infection prevention control, and you don't have clinicians coming into the nursing home and either making themselves at risk for COVID-19 or spreading the infection. It also allows um, out-of-state practitioners that are uh, to provide services across state lines. However, there are certain conditions and some states are kind of pushing back a little bit on that now. And I've heard from providers that it can be tricky to get licensed in another state. It sometimes takes a while and there are a lot of hoops to jump over. And thankfully, clinicians can render telehealth services from their home, which is really great. So a lot of people working from home, providing uh, health care services. And we appreciate that we have this waiver that allows patients to be in their homes as well. We, if telehealth visits are paid by federal health care programs, there is an option to waive cost sharing with telehealth, which is pretty important. Patients often don't understand why they have to pay the same and pay the same copay for what they would call a video visit versus an in-person visit. If you are acting in good faith and you have a HIPAA violation, you are probably going to be okay. The Office of Civil Rights has said they will not go after you um, if you have a, a HIPAA violation. And additionally, there are some uh, allowances for patient sharing. State Medicaid agencies and private insurers, they tend to follow Medicare slash CMS with regard to the set of allowable codes that is now 250 or so codes. Payment parity means uh, payment the same for in-person as for telehealth visits and Medicare reimburses at the same rate, although we may see this change. And most state Medicaid agencies pay at the same rate as well. And more than half of our states have legislation in place to ensure that private insurers also pay at parity. Consent for telehealth services for Medicaid beneficiaries seems to differ dramatically by state. It's important to know what your state consent is. Some don't require consent for telehealth visits at all. Um, so you just have to know state by state. And billing and coding is different from Medicare to each state Medicaid agency among private insurers. Private insurers usually have good information on their websites. So in the audio portion, the um, audio and video, um, not all Medicaid agencies require the video portion. I think that's an error on the slide there. So even prior to the public health emergency, not all Medicaid agencies required the video portion. So what are telehealth services that the care team can participate in? So you may or may not know that office visits are categorized as new or established. So if we haven't seen a patient in three years, we can consider them a new patient. And ENM visits or evaluation and management visits are office visits. And um, there used to be 10, so five levels each for new and established patients, although 99201, which used to be the new patient office visit code has been deleted, and there are also prolonged service codes. And we'll talk in a second a little bit about these um, ENM visits, because in 2021, the coding can be based on time and CMS has said that there are additional activities that can count toward the time on the 2021 office visit codes. Advanced care planning is a telehealth code and service that definitely lends itself well to our ends, helping to provide portions of the advanced care planning. And if ever there was a time for advanced care planning, it's now. So a patient may want to be do not intubate or do not resuscitate or DNR, DNI but they wanna change their mind and they may say, oh, well, I have 
if I uh, end up in the ICU and need a ventilator, yes, I definitely do want to go on the ventilator if it's COVID-19. And so now is the time to start checking in with patients and doing telehealth advanced care planning. Transitional care management is also can also be provided by telehealth. There are two codes. Reimbursement was increased for 2020. So the reimbursement for those are quite good. And now we're going to see more patients being released from the hospital who require transitional care management follow-up to support them right after their discharge and to make sure that they don't get readmitted. The initial, the welcome to Medicare visit and the subsequent Medicare annual wellness visit, both of those codes and services can be provided by telehealth and registered nurses or RNs can conduct several elements of these visits and often run the program to ensure that all Medicare patients receive those annual wellness visits um, every single year. There is a resource, the link is in the slide, and um, it does state kind of who can do what during those CMS Medicare wellness visits. Individuals with diabetes have Medicare benefits that allow them certain number of hours for diabetes self-management training and medical nutrition therapy. They are only referred like maybe five to 10% of the time for these services. And so this is an opportunity now to provide these services by telehealth. And the same is true for chronic kidney disease. The counseling visit to discuss the need for lung cancer screening using low-dose CT scan. I've heard that this code has been deleted and, and can no longer be used and the service can no longer be provided both in person and in telehealth. But as of today, that code is still listed in the CMS lookup. There are a lot of telehealth codes for, uh, for treatment of opioid use disorder and RNs often run the program to operationalize and streamline the workflows and coordinate care and provide care management um, for our individuals with opioid use disorder. So just a little sidebar on those evaluation and management or office visit codes for 2021. There's a big change where the code can be billed based on how much time is spent with the patient. And check that lower right-hand corner, the activities that count towards that time include preparing to see the patient, counseling and education, educating the patient, care coordination, et cetera. And so many of those activities can be provided by nursing staff or other members on the care team. There are other telehealth codes that can be billed. Um, the reimbursement is not so great, but usually it's the care team delivering these types of services. So talking to patients, identifying whether patients are smokers or tobacco users, and then talking to them about um, smoking cessation, portions of that really need to be provided by the clinician according to the service description. However, these are options as well for telehealth. Other virtual services. So there are e-visits, which are online digital evaluation services. So it's kind of like a office visit using the patient portal. Um, CMS really wants to use these to ensure that we accommodate patients and take care of patients' needs the way they want them taken care of um, and avoid an office visit if possible. Um, what this would look like would be a, on the patient portal, a patient could send a secure message. So if I'm a clinician, well, I am a clinician, but if I were practicing and a patient sent me a message through the patient portal and said, you know, I'm having uh, I have a cough and I have a fever. Uh, do I need to come in for antibiotics? I could ask for a little more information to ensure that they're not having shortness of breath or any other warning signs. And um, I might be able to say, uh, let's just do watchful waiting. Um, if you have uh, any worsening of symptoms, make sure you call this number. For now, you don't need um, antibiotics, but let's just do watchful waiting. So that's kind of what an e-visit would look like. I will say that not a lot of practices that I work with are using the e-visit option. We also have the telephone evaluation and management code, which is only being used during the public health emergency. And I'm gonna take a little bit of a deeper dive into each of these um, to 
look at it through the RN lens, like for all of these, like where is the role of the RN or the rest of the care team? We'll talk a little bit about virtual communication services. There are two of those. So there's the virtual check-in, which is basically a check-in phone call and the remote evaluation of pre-recorded patient information, which might be where a patient would, using secure texting, for example, would send a picture of a skin lesion and um, the clinician and the patient could use asynchronous communication to discuss the image and the treatment plan. Chronic and principal care management is terribly underused, but um, is a really great option. And it can, uh, care management programs can be run and executed by nurses, of course. There's the behavioral health integration, which is very similar to the chronic and principal care management and the collaborative care model, um, which does require a team, a based approach, and does require a psychiatric consultant Interprofessional consultation, hmm, um, we'll just touch on that, and remote physiologic monitoring, which is an amazing option for remote service delivery. And it is also the one that has the most evidence behind it for reducing emergency department visits and um, admissions and readmissions. So these are the, this is specific to RN. So what can the role of the RN be? These are the telehealth services. Um, these are the ones that we already went over. On the left-hand side are the service details. On the right is the code and the CMS price. And this does provide an opportunity for nurses to identify their value. So for example, if a nurse is uh, providing the majority of the advanced care planning, uh, in conjunction with their clinician, you can see that there's a, there's a $85 for the first 30 minutes and uh, $74 for each additional 30 minutes. Um, you know, there is a substantial argument for our, the value of the RN in supporting delivery of these services. So for the new and established office visits, the nurse role can be the same as it was for in-person visits. And nurses can even bill the level one office visit 99211 by telehealth, which is an amazing option. Uh, transitional care management, we often see that the nurse is very involved in this and they will call the patient. Um, they will reconcile medications. They'll make sure the patient has what they need. They'll make sure the patient is able to access their prescribed medications, they're able to get to the pharmacy to get them, they'll provide patient education and a lot around transitional care management. And the reimbursement for these is very, very high. Medicare feels that these codes are underutilized and so they have increased reimbursement to uh, encourage people to use those screening and assessment services. So this is a, a very small reimbursement, but there's some argument that if you are administering these screenings or assessments for review by the clinician, that this can really add up. So, you know, I'm not sure whether PHQ-9 would fit under this, but possibly advanced childhood or uh, adverse childhood experiences screening, those types of screenings should probably fall under the 96127. And there are, again, as we mentioned, the Welcome to Medicare and the subsequent annual wellness visits, which RNs honestly often do the heavy lifting for these, including identifying who's due, conducting the outreach, helping with documentation. Um, and this is a huge service. I think also during COVID-19, it's really helpful as a way to do outreach to patients, to, especially our older patients, to make sure they're doing okay, they're not lonely, they have what they need, et cetera. Chronic disease patient education, the RNs, can be instrumental in developing and delivering part of the education program, making sure who needs to have this education. This is a covered Medicare benefit for those who are diagnosed with chronic kidney disease. I'm not gonna to touch on the counseling for lung cancer screening because I'm still not entirely sure whether this um, code has been removed. And again, there are a lot of, there were three, these three codes were actually added for 2020. Um, and as you can see, there is substantial reimbursement 
This, I do believe, takes a team-based effort, and it is going to be the clinician leading this, but there are still ample opportunities to identify how and where an RN can be lever leveraged to optimize this uh, important work. So the other virtual services that we were talking about um, previously on the PowerPoint slides, the chronic and principal care management. This honestly is usually almost all of chronic and principal care management is provided by RNs and the rest of the care team. So there's a huge opportunity for an RN to really organize the care management program provide some of the training to LPNs and MAs, to um, document in the EHR, to track reimbursement, et cetera, et cetera. This is one, these services, chronic and principal care management, are key to enhancing services to our high-risk, high-need patients. And Medicare is um, trying to get better uptake of these services, which, and there's a great role for the RN. And as you can see, by the column on the right-hand side, there's also substantial reimbursement possibilities um, that an RN can provide assistance with capturing these by um, adding to the services that are provided to patients, coordinating, um, getting patients scheduled, et cetera. The behavioral health integration codes are very similar to the chronic care management and principal care management. It's basically to provide 20 minutes or more of the same type of services, but for people with any type of mental health diagnosis or substance use disorder. The psychiatric collaborative care model or CoCM does require a team, but again, there are ample opportunities for nurses to be involved in um, providing these services, getting them going, taking care of all of the requirements, building what needs to be in the EHR, um, and so supporting this revenue by supporting behavioral health integration and the collaborative care model. Remote physiologic monitoring. Technically, remote physiologic monitoring can only be billed for using the service codes that describe electronic transmission of the data. So using Bluetooth or other electronic means to supply or transmit that information. However, there are ample opportunities for RNs to support a, re a remote patient monitoring program, including helping the patient get set up um, and educating the patient on use of the equipment. There are other remote patient monitoring options for billing and coding. However, just be clear that this does not fit into what CMS considers remote physiologic monitoring. It is remote patient monitoring from uh, an operations uh, standpoint, um, but most people do not consider self-measured blood pressure monitoring or blood glucose monitoring or continuous blood glucose monitoring as remote physiologic monitoring. E-visits, you know, uh, RNs are not included in the six codes that describe these services. However, um, there is a, the option for the, the, the codes describing evaluation and assessment services. It's worthwhile looking into this option. And the same is true for the telephone evaluation and management. So this is like an office visit using just the telephone. Um, and while I think there is an excellent opportunity for the RN to talk to the patient before or after, maybe to document, um, you know, I'm just not sure that it's to the level of an RN, what's required of an RN, and we always want to optimize and elevate our RN so that they are performing at the top of licensure and scope. The virtual communication services, there are two of them, and they have to be uh, uh, initiated by the patient. They are short interactions with patients, usually five to 10 minutes, although there's a new code for 2021 for 11 to 22 minutes, but it's unlikely that these provide opportunities for RN inclusion, although there have been some coding changes around to, uh, in 2021 that may um, make it easier for RN and other care team member inclusion. There are five service codes for interprofessional consultation and in the rural settings, this makes a, a lot of sense. So you can have, it's, it's a way to bill for 
um, almost like electronic consult, but it's not electronic consult. It's kind of asynchronous um, consultation with specialists. Um, however, I'm unsure that there's a clear role for RNs in this work. Consent is required for telehealth. Medicare requires that we document if there's gonna be any cost sharing, any deductible that they need to, to pay. And I think this is a response to the surprise that patients have when they are billed for a telehealth visit because they, as I mentioned earlier, they say, well, you know, we just did a, a video visit or, you know, we did a, a phone call, you know, why in the world do I need to um, pay? So we don't want surprise billing. So Medicare does require this consent. It's pretty easy and straightforward um, and nurses can obtain it. On the other hand, um, Utah Medicaid obtaining consent is pretty complex. I do think there's an opportunity to create guidance in the electronic health record to ensure that um, the consent is obtained for Medicaid beneficiaries if a telehealth visit is going to be performed. So quality improvement and measurement. So, you know, there is, um, you can uh, track your in-person versus telehealth um, only versus other virtual services. A lot of the practices that I work with have really nice run charts that show the use of in-person telehealth and other virtual services over time. And we're seeing that the in-person visits are coming up and the telehealth and virtual visits are going down um, as things are opening up. And while COVID-19 rates are, um, coming down. Uh, just to be clear, this webinar was being re-recorded in February 2021 because the original recording back in November of 2020 experienced technical difficulties. It's useful to look at no-show rates. Uh, one practice that I was working with in Los Angeles when they were using the telephone ENM codes, their no-show rate was 5%, but then when they switched to telehealth and required audio and visual, their no-show rates went to 50%, indicating that this was not working for patients. Make sure your quality measures are not falling off. It's really hard to do pre-visit planning and outreach around colorectal cancer screening using telehealth especially when it's difficult to, you can't hand out the fecal occult blood testing cards. You can't schedule patients with the GI suite because they're not seeing patients yet. They haven't opened it up. So take a look at your quality measures to see what the impact of telehealth is having on those. It's reasonable to ensure that patients have a decent level of satisfaction with telehealth. They always want to see us in person, but you know, if they have to do telehealth, is it working okay for them? Is it working well for staff? You want to see what your cycle times are like. Some practices have actually found that their cycle times have gotten longer with telehealth, and so they've found ways to reduce those cycle times. Access, access to behavioral health, you know, is it better with telemental uh, services or is it worse? Most practices are seeing that it's better. So just think about what you can improve and measure um, in the realm of quality improvement and always be clear on what we're trying to accomplish. Make sure you have a good aim statement. Know, keep measuring so that you will know that a change is an improvement or whether a change is an improvement. And then think about what changes you can make that will result in improvement. And honestly, the workflows around telehealth, many, many opportunities for improvement. Um, look and see through your patient's eyes and ensure that that telehealth visit from start to finish and in between um, is efficient and serves patients and staff alike. Quality assurance. When I think about quality assurance and telehealth, I think, how do we make sure that all patients have the high, same high value telehealth experience regardless of anything, whether gender, race, insurance, clinician, day of the week, time of the day. Um, and we know this is an issue. So depending on where the patient lives, for example, they may have unreliable broadband or unavailable broadband. 
think about what your telehealth perspective is. Is this, when you think about telehealth, is this, is this just um, a stopgap until the public health emergency is over? Or are you truly in with both feet? And this is something that we're going to continue past the public health emergency. I think sometimes we make a little bit of a bigger deal of telehealth than we need to. It's really an effective modality for healthcare service delivery. It's not something we need to have a huge budget around. Honestly, if you have a computer with a microphone and a camera and you have some sort of a platform which doesn't have to be expensive, in fact, there are free platforms out there, there's not much more that you need to deliver telehealth with both the audio and the, and the video components. Um, there are inequities and barriers um, and it doesn't quite belong in this spot. Um, but not everybody has digital proficiency, not everybody has a device, not everybody has connectivity, um, and this is a big problem. Maybe for another echo session, we can talk about community-based solutions for this inequity and barriers. And then training, make sure everybody is trained on telehealth, including camera placement, including acknowledging when patients speak, including everything. Make sure everybody has been trained to the max so that everybody has the same high value experience. So if I were to say, you know, what are the takeaways from today? So telehealth and virtual services, nothing new. Telehealth has been around for decades. Um, it's really just another modality to deliver services, expand access, keep patients safe. It's an option. And yes, a lot of patients are going to want to go back to in-person visits, but we shouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater when the public health emergency is over. We should keep telehealth alive, um, optimize our virtual services because this serves our patients. Know the full range of options and oper operationalize what's best for you and your patients. I have to tell you that clinicians usually do not have practice management as part of their education. And so they don't know the billing options. Um, we, have to, we have to help them understand. And I say that as a clinician myself, um, and I didn't know about billing and all of those things until I had to manage my own safety net clinic. Um, and don't abandon your in-person procedures and workflows, even though there have been few I think maybe there was one or two malpractice suits uh, around telehealth prior to the public health emergency. We are going to see missed and delayed diagnoses. We're gonna see people who are not happy with their service. Um, and I'm, I'm really worried about the consequences. So make sure that you don't abandon your in-person procedures and workflows, modify them around telehealth. But you don't want, for example, pre-visit planning and identifying who's due for what and connecting people or scheduling people or writing down what the plan is for something like colorectal cancer screening when the public health emergency is over and things open up. So I think the final thing I'll say is around improvement science, measure, improve, and measure. That should be your clinic mantra. And the other clinic mantra around improvement science, of course, is thou shalt not, uh, thou shalt not decrease clinic productivity. If you have follow-up questions, want to tell us more, have comments, you can contact Adrian, Sarah, or Trudy. I thank you so much for your time listening to this webinar recording. I hope you have a great day.